Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for coming. Welcome to this session. Uh, I am here to talk to you about CMD parallel programming with the Vector API. That's the title of the session. Uh, I would like to start with a word of warning because there's another Vector API in the JDK, Java Util Vector API, and I'm not going to talk about that. So if some of you made a confusion, maybe it's not too late to join another session. This session will be very different and will cover something, uh, well, hopefully more recent, more advanced, and uh, at least from my point of view, more interesting. <laughs> My name is Jose. Uh, when I'm bored, I push links, I push stuff on the internet, usually, on YouTube, on GitHub, on many places. So if you're bored too, you can <laughs> check them out if you want, while having a cup of coffee. I work uh, as a Java developer, advocate for the Java platform group at Oracle. I joined them about two years and a half ago. I used to be uh, working at a university in Paris, not before that. Uh, we launched several um, years ago now, a little more than two years ago, the dev.java website, which should be a, a good source of documentation on everything Java, which is the language, the APIs, the tooling, the JVM, whatever. And I don't think there's any written content on the Vector API yet. Uh, maybe that would be a good idea to do something about it. Uh, we also uh, publish uh, some content on the internet with the rest of the team, N uh, Billy, Nikolai, and uh, Anna. So you can uh, tune in on YouTube, the youtube.com slash at Java, and you'll find our channel with uh, quite a lot of content, many things. Uh, of course, the hot uh, topic as of now is the release of the, uh, the, of the JDK 21, which just happened uh, a few days ago, actually, a few weeks ago. Uh, and we have this Road to 21 Java series that covers almost everything new in the, in the JDK 21. So in case you're interested in that, you can, uh, you can watch that. Uh, I uh, take care of a series called the JEP Cafe. And uh, there was a JEP Cafe uh, specifically on the Vector API that you may want to watch if you want to see more examples, more code in actions, uh, this kind of thing. All right, so what is the, the, the Vector API? The Vector API uh, was first released uh, uh, along with the JDK 16. That was a long time ago. Uh, so if you're still using the JDK 17, maybe some of you are still using 17? Yeah, a fair amount of you, I'd say maybe two thirds. A version older than 17? All right, Java 8 or something? Oh, come on. You know you're using a Java version that is 10 years old, right? Almost 10 years old. <laughs> okay, so no Vector API for you, unfortunately. You need to be at least on 17 if you just consider the LTS. You'll have the second incubator, I think, in the 17. And the sixth incubator was released as part of the JDK uh, 21. So that, that's the JEP you want to read if you want to have more details on uh, what I'm going to, to tell you. Okay, the first question is, what does this CMD computing mean? M maybe some of you never heard about this before. Can you tell me? Yes, a fair amount of you. Who already programmed CMD computers? Now you're telling me your age, if you really did that. <laughs> CMD computing is about parallel computing. And maybe if you think about parallel computing, the first idea that comes to your mind is parallel streams. Right? You write this kind of code, you've got a big array, full of integers, all different, and you stream them, you call parallel, magically will be computed in parallel. That's just great. You map, you filter, you reduce, and you get a result. Hopefully faster than if you didn't call parallel, which is not always the case, unfortunately. It may even be slower. It depends on what you're really doing. But if you're doing that, you're not doing parallel computing. You are computing things in parallel. I may be thinking, ah, this guy is playing on words. Yes, I am playing on words, but it has its importance. Okay. By the way, there is another uh, way of doing things in parallel in a JDK, because you have parallel methods on this big static factory class arrays uh, full of uh, static methods. And some of them are well, prefixed with parallel. They are doing things in parallel in the same kind of things, in the same kind of way as the str parallel streams uh, are working. 
How are parallel streams working in a nutshell? You have this big array full of whatever. You are going to split it, and then to split it again, and again, and again, and again, up to a point where the API decides that you have small chunks of data that are small enough uh, to be computed individually. OK? Uh, they are, there is a number of things on which you don't have the hand when you're doing when you're playing with this kind of uh, of thing. First, you do not control how things are split. If it's an array, the API will split it by the middle. So hopefully, you have the same amount of data on the right side of your array and on the left side of your array, which is the case for a release, for instance. But maybe not so much the case for hash set, which is also based on an hash map that is typically an array. You don't know how many data you have on the left side and on the right side, and then you're in trouble because you're not splitting your data into equal parts. All right? There's a problem of balancing. And the second thing you do not control is what is the point at which the API will stop. Okay? This small array of two elements here, it's just a, some kind of vision, it's just a sketch, but actually you can't control that. Okay? And once this is done, your API is just handling a bunch of small arrays, and then it will apply your map filter reduction, whatever, on each of these array. Each one of these array individually in different threads. Everything is taking place in a special pool, as you know, which is called a common fork join pool. It's a pool of threads that has as many threads as you have cores on your CPU by default. OK, and what are, what are you going to do with all these small pieces of reduced arrays? Well, you need to merge them. To merge them a first time, and then a second time, and then a final time to create the result you are going to use. OK? So now, actually, you have two algorithms that are executed by your, by your API. The first one is your map filter reduce. And the second one is the reduction of all these partial results that you've computed again and again until you have the final result. Now, most of the time, these two algorithms are the same. If you're taking a max, for instance, or a sum, it's the same. But if you're, if you're sorting your array, it's not the same. You are sorting each array individually. And then when you merge everything together, you apply another algorithm which is called a merge sort, which is another algorithm. Okay. When you're using this kind of thing, everything is based on threads. Your tasks are running on a common for join pool, as I just said. It's built on threads, so it means that if you, <laughs> if you didn't program the things in the your, your algorithm in the right way, you may come across some all the great problems you have with concurrent programming, which is typically rest condition, blocking issues, visibility issues from one point to the other, that will just slow down all your process. Okay. And there are, there are situations where you should really want to avoid uh, th this kind of approach. First, first situation, if you have an I.O. Um, an I.O. Uh, source, for instance, if you are streaming the lines of a text file, there is a method for that in the JDK, you should clearly not go. Uh, clear not use a parallel stream because if you're doing that, well, basically you don't have anything to split because you're reading it lazily while you're 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 uh, you are processing it. So just don't do that. Uh, you shouldn't do any kind of input output within the the methods of your of your parallel stream. Anybody's doing that? No, no one. Okay, good. Uh, you shouldn't try to do any side effect in your intermediate operation. Okay, you shouldn't try to fill uh, an, an external release from your map method, for instance, or, or, or from a peak method. If you do that, you'll go into race conditions. And there are some operations of the stream API that will actually probably slow down your operations, like the skip or the limit. The limit method tells you that if you have a limit thousand, for instance, that your stream should only process the thousand first elements of your stream. It's not thousand elements randomly taken from your stream. It's really the first one. So it means that the counter that will process your data needs to be shared among all your threads. And this shared variable, this shared mutable state, uh, will slow down 
your uh, your processing. Okay, but probably the biggest caveat of that is that if you're in a Spring Boot application, for instance, you are going to use the core of your CPUs to hopefully speed up your processing, but actually you may slow down the whole application because your threads and your, your, the cores of your CPU should be used uh, to serve your clients, not to speed up some kind of stupid map filter reduced you're doing in one thread for one client. Okay, so using that is actually quite hard. Using that in the right way is actually uh, quite hard. Um, and you, you should definitely measure the performances, not of your individual computation, but the performances of your role application using some kind of parallel computation at one point or another, and not using them. Because odds are that probably not doing parallel computation would be better for your server or your application on your role. What kind of gain can you expect with such an approach? Well, if you have eight cores or 12 cores and things go well, you can expect probably something like 12 minus the overhead of splitting your array, distributing everything among the threads. The fork join pool is taking its toll because it's, it's running and it needs itself some, some kind of computing power. If it's, if it's not much, it's probably, it will probably lower your computation. If you have 12 cores and, and on a regular uh, algorithm that works well, you gain a factor of 10. That, that's nice. That's probably good. Probably good enough. Okay, But there is something you absolutely need to keep in mind, is that you need to measure your performances precisely. There is only one tool for that, which is called JMH. I guess you already know this tool. If you're using system.currentTime in millis or system nanotimes and doing some kind of loop, you are measuring something that is absolutely not the performances of what you want to measure, so don't do that. Check the JMH <laughs> documentation. It's on your PNGDK website and on GitHub. You should definitely measure uh, your performance gain with JMH. And you should measure it in the same uh, configuration as your production environment. If you are developing your code on a, some kind of good laptop or good desktop computer, whether it's a Mac or a PC, it doesn't matter, and you have a, a CPU with eight or 12 cores and you're alone on it and you have only your IDE and your, your Spring Boot and everything that is running, you're basically not using your CPU. So when you launch your, your benchmark, your CPU will be used 100% of the time if you're doing that. But then your production environment, if it's a container with just 0 0.7 CPU, then you understand that your parallel stream is not going to work very well. Okay, <laughs> so just, just think about that. You need to measure your performances in your production environment. Right. CMD has nothing to do with that. Okay, which is a good news. Which is a good news. And you are going to see what, why in a minute. What does, what is CMD, what does CMD mean? CMD means single instruction multiple data. You probably already know that. And what is it? What is SIMD? Short answer, it's an old concept. Okay, maybe some of you know these machines? No? Yes? Oh, now you're telling your age, guys. <laughs> I'm sorry to tell you that. <laughs> so the first one is a connection machine 5 from a company called the Thinking Machine that I don't think it does exist anymore. And it's a machine uh, that was built in the, in the 90s, late, maybe late 80s mid-90s, something like that. Uh, it, it was really the, the, the size of a cupboard, right? You, you, need, you, you need a special room to store this kind of machine with a special cooling system because you could uh, cook an omelette on this kind of, uh, <laughs> of cupboard. <laughs> the second one is a, is a machine built by uh, Texas Instruments. Still exists. And the last one is probably the most expensive of them. It's a Cray computer, right? I think it's a Cray YMP. I'm not sure of that, but I think that's yes, the one. Is. Yes, it is? Okay, thank you. Cray was acquired by some microsystem, from what I recall at some point. And there is still some technology from the Cray computers in some uh, SunSpark uh, CPU. And those are actually seats, by the way. Yes, yes. The, 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 the little stuff that you have here, okay, th these are seats. You can sit on that and uh, 
just to watch the machine working because it was, yeah. So all these are CMD machines. The Cray is a little uh, more sophisticated than that, but the CM5 and the Texas Instrument one, they are CMD machines. You have 64,000 super powerful computers in them, uh, CPUs in them, running at the extraordinary speed of like 50 kilohertz. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? There's actually probably more computing power in this clicker <laughs> in these machines. <laughs> I'm not completely kidding. I mean, uh, yeah, this is how, how computing evo evolved over the time. I was lucky enough to write code for two of them. Really lucky. So how is it working? That, that's really the most important thing to understand, because if you don't understand this part, you will not understand anything in the rest. <clears throat> so when I was a student, that was uh, some time ago, we were, we were taught that computers were organized around processing units. And in a CPU, you had a single processing unit. Now you have like 100 of them, something like that, because you have like 10 per core times 10 cores that in the order of the 100. And the processing unit is able to do very simple operations like increment, add, subtract. Uh, only using integers at that time. Now it can also do floating point operation. The floating point unit is separated from the integer uh, um, unit, but it's all integrated on, on one core of a processor. At the time, it was not the case, of course. And it would act on registered. So you have input registers and output register. So if you load a value, first, first instruction is to load values 10 and 20. So you have a special memory bank where the instruction of the program you're executing uh, are, are read. So first CPU cycle, load. And a 10 and a 20 will happily appear in the register. And second instruction, add. And guess what? It would add 10 and 20 and give you the result 30, which is probably expected. So that's a single processing unit. And on a CMD machine, Single instruction, multiple data, it also means that you have multiple processing units. So instead of having one, for instance, you have four, okay? With the same bank where your program resides, it's just a set of assembly instructions, okay? And it has access, the, the register are actually connected to a specific memory. So on modern CPUs, you have this kind of thing. You have the main memory. These are the components that you buy and you plug in your laptop. You have the cache memory that is on the CPU, connected through buses to the main memory. You have registers, which is still another stuff. And you have this specific memory that is your SIMD memory. Because currently the CPU can do both classical computation and SIMD computation. The connection machine only had a SIMD kernel, so you only had the program memory with the, the assembly instruction to execute and the data memory which was the CMD memory, but there was only that. Okay. All right, so what is going to happen when I execute a load, for instance? Well, all the registers of each processing unit are connected to a different place of this special CMD memory. So actually, when you execute load, all your processing units are going to execute this load, but they are going to load different data. So we, we will have 10 and 10 in the first registers, 21 and 30 in the second, etc. Okay, But all this happens on the same CPU cycle because everything is synchronous. You're basically, instead of loading one piece of data on one, uh, from, from your, the cache of your CPU to the registers of your, of your, of your um, uh, processing unit on a classical core, here you are loading a bunch of data at the same time in one CPU cycle in different places, in different registers of your processing units. Okay? This, is, this is parallel. We are not doing any multi-threading here. We're not talking threads. We're not talking concurrent programming. This is really parallel stuff. It's really happening in parallel. And when you're doing add, well, all these registers are going to be added on the same CPU cycle at the same time. No thread, no overhead whatsoever, 
just parallel addition of all the values in your registers. Okay? And of course, you can do many more, much more things than just add. Add is just a simple example. So you see that the approach is completely different. No thread, no concurrent programming, no race conditions, no blocking, no visibility, nothing. No splitting of your data, because actually the data is kind of pre-splitted by the architecture of your hardware. No partial reduction, we are going to see that. Actually, when you do a sort with this kind of approach, you don't need merge sort, because in the, at the end of the day, your array will be sorted in parallel. Okay. Is there an overhead? Well, on a CM5, there's no overhead. You just compute things super quickly. Okay. On a kernel of a Core i7 or AMD CPU, you have an overhead, which is the loading of your data from the main memory or the cache to this specific SIMD memory, to this vector memory. And this is an overhead. And if you want to use this data in the, I would say, the normal portions of your code, at some point you will need to unload it and to put it back to an array to be able to print it on the console, for instance. All right, so first question, what is this data memory, this vector memory, the little black stuff that I showed you uh, on the right? And second question, what are the available operations? This is, this is what you need to understand, to understand how the, the vector API uh, has, been, uh, has been designed. Because it really, this API really sticks to the hardware. Java is write once, run anywhere. The vector API is write once and try to run as best as I can on every kind of uh, CPU. <laughs> so what is the SIMD way of computing things? It relies on specific hardware elements that you have on each CPU core of, of your CPU first, and on a set of assembly instructions. Yes, there's a question, please. Yeah, probably I have a preliminary question. Sure. I mean, my understanding is that these processing units are somewhat independent, right? So what's the gain of doing exactly the same operation instead of having each doing something different? Uh, so the question is what the gain of uh, doing the same operation on different pieces of data? The gain is that instead of processing data element by element, number by number, you process it four numbers at a time on the, on the, the sketch I just showed you. So if you do that, in one addition, you have actually executed four additions on four different pairs of integers. Oh, so okay. you, you gain a factor of four. But, but, but otherwise, those processing units are totally dependent. So while, while one is doing an addition, the other can do something No, else. they are not in the... So the question is, these processing units are independent? They are not. Mm -hmm. They are executing the same ex assembly instruction at the same time. They are reading the same assembly instruction because there's only one assembly instruction. So on the same CPU cycle, they are executing the same instruction. The data is different, so you get a factor of four. Thanks. I would say for free, well, nothing is free. <laughs> the SIMD CPUs are not speci specifically free. So the specific assembly instructions that you're looking for when you have a... a Intel CPU or AMD or anywhere, any, any other CPU, is uh, called AVX something. Uh, and it, I, I think it goes from 64 to uh, 512. 64, 128, 256, 512. Odds are that if you have a regular CPU, desktop, desktop Intel-based um, processor or laptop-based processor, you are, you, what you have in your machine is an AVX 256. Uh, currently, from what I saw, AVX 512 is available on IN Xeon processors. Uh, you may have access to that, but it's more expensive than a, a regular a Core i7 uh, CPU. It does not rely on concurrency, which is probably something that makes partly, well, <laughs> I was about to say it makes things simple, but the, the vector API is not simple, so <laughs> in the end, it's not sure that you're you have a real gain there. Uh, and if you want to exactly understand how you want to program your, 
your application or the, the, the processing that you need to really leverage and to really gain amazing uh, performances, you need to clearly check what the CPU you're, work, you're running on is capable of. AVX256, most probably, but there are also options under that that you need to check, and I'm going to give you hints uh, about that. Okay, so this memory, so first, first answer, uh, it relies on specific hardware elements, and the first element you need to understand is the specific memory that is connected to your processing unit. Okay, so this memory is actually uh, 256 bits if you are using AVX 256 and 512 if you're using AVX 512, that's okay. And it can handle uh, all the, the integers, the, the integer types and the floating point types. So bytes, shorts, ints or floats and longs or double. So if you're doing computation on doubles, for instance, you, will, can, you, you can expect a factor a gain of a factor four because you will be computing your doubles four by four. But that's four per core that you have because you have 12 cores, so you have 12 kernel, uh, CMD kernel on your CPU. Okay, so if you're just using one core, maybe you have a factor of four, but if you're using 10 cores, then you may have a gain of, uh, of 40 maybe. Uh, so 260 bit, this is what I have on my laptop, for instance. No, it makes things uh, simple. Okay. Uh, in a nutshell, the, the CMD processing unit is able to process numbers. No objects, no strings of characters, just numbers. If you interpret your numbers at code, as con code points, you will end up processing strings. But you really need to think about the fact that what you're processing are arrays of numbers. What are the pros of this? It does not rely on concurrent programming, which is nice because concurrent programming is hard to understand. Maybe the cons is that it relies on CMD computing, which is also hard to understand. So you're exchanging one hard thing for another one. Okay, that's okay. Uh, you don't need, you don't have any overhead for the splitting and the merging of your data which is great because that's really an overhead. The cons, well, you still have an overhead, which is the loading and the unloading of your vectors, and we're going to see the patterns of code to do that. The algorithms may be a little more complex. You need to think about it as a CMD computation, and we're not used to that. We're not used to thinking that way, but it's, <laughs> it's a lot of fun, actually. <laughs> okay, sorry. Uh, and the, the, the fact that the code you're writing is efficient or not depends actually on what your CPU can do. And it does not depend only on the fact that you have 256 bits or 512 bits available for your computation. It also, also relies on, uh, on more things than that. So let us take a look at some code. How can you add to vectors? Simple things first. You need to load them. So I have a first vector of integers whatever the length of this vector, and we're going to see how, how it is going to be, to be working. And I'm also create a, a, another array to store the result of my computation. So first you need to create a vector in the vector API sense, all right, that will actually load the content of this array in this, I called it CMD memory. You see the little black array you had on the right? And this is, this is the, the from array factory method that we're going to use from the int vector uh, factory class. Well, it's not a factory class, but it's a factory method. From the int vector class. Okay, the int vector class, why do I use, use it? Because I'm dealing with int vectors. Uh, okay, if I, if I had long vectors, that I would be using the long vector uh, class. There's also a long vector class. And I need to pass a special object called a species object. Now, this species object is very important, and we're going to play it well to, to see more information about it. This PC object, you can uh, get it with this. Uh, f actually, it's a, it's, it's a constant that is computed um, at runtime. This in vector dot species preferred. And that the preferred species when you're dealing with ints on your CPU. And this. Uh, 
special object carries actually uh, several information. Two of them are really important. First, the fact that you're processing integers, int, 32 bits, like in that sense. And second, it also carries the fact that you're running on a 256 a CPU, because this object is not the same if you're running on 256, 128, or 512. So you may be developing your code on a specific machine, running it on some kind of IN server that will be 512, the code will be the same, which is a good news. And if you want um, the VM to be kind with you and give you actually performances, you need to put this species object in a, in a constant. So I put it here in private static final, and the rest is not on the method, so it does not compile at all, but PowerPoint doesn't, doesn't care. PowerPoint, PowerPoint is a very good compiler that will never give you uh, any kind of error, apart if you make some kind of autograph <laughs> issues on this. Okay, so you need to put that in a constant, basically. I'm not sure it's clearly mentioned in the JEP, but this is how the JVM will like, uh, will like it. Okay, so now I have this species object. I'm loading my array in a vector v1. How can I add v1 and v2? And that's the magic of this API. It's super simple. You just call the add method, and it will add v1 and v2. Okay, in one CPU cycle, whatever the size of v1 and v2, as long as it's compatible with the kernel array you're using. This is done in parallel, and you just write this kind of Java code. Now, if you want to store the result in an array, yeah, question? What is the last parameter? Is the, the, um, it's the offset? Yes, it's the offset. I was thinking offset of the length, no, but the, the length in this species, this is the offset. And after that, if you want to put the result in an array, you just call result dot into array, pass the, the array you prepared to, to hold the result, and it will just be pushed uh, in this array. Okay, that's the basic the basic pattern. The add operation is actually an assembly instruction of your v e v x two fifty six set of instruction. That's a method that maps directly to an assembly instruction, and you don't have to write this assembly instruction yourself, which is great. Okay, you have many more. Uh, operations, such operations on, the, on, on on this vector object. I just put them here. So, of course, the four uh, operations. Note that these methods are the same whether you're using float, floating point numbers or integer numbers. They just are on different objects. So that, that maps to the correct uh, assembly instruction. You have the absolute value, negative, min, max, equal, greater than, less than, and you also have bitwise operations. Please go to the Java doc if you want to know more, because there are a lot of them, and it would be a little tedious to present them one by one. OK, so we did that. There is one caveat, is that odds are you're not going to process only eight ints at a time, right? Your array may be a little bigger. So how can you handle the fact that the, the, the array you have doesn't match the size of the array from your CMD kernel? OK. Well, you have a nifty instruction in the Java language called the for loop. <laughs> Everybody knew the for loop before? Yeah, OK. <laughs> oh, you're telling your age. <laughs> so now you need to write a for loop. Ah, we hate for loop. Yes, I do hate for loop, but you need to do that. OK, so stop whining. <laughs> for loop for the win. <laughs> OK, so I will just, if I add eight stuff, I will just uh, add 8 to my index, because I know that I can hold 8 integers in my CMD <laughs> kernel and loop through all the array of my, uh, of my computer. Now I got a little problem. You see, I, I put this 8 in red. I got a little problem, which is this 8 is actually dependent on the type of data I'm using, which is an integer, and on the size of this kernel memory I'm running on, 256. All right? So you shouldn't put 8 like that in your code. Don't do that. You knew that already. Yes, you did. OK, good. There is the, actually this, this species object knows that you're using integers and knows that you're running on this specific hardware 256 or 512. So there is a method on this species object that knows exactly 
the size of the array, the, 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 the number of elements you should move to this array because it knows the size of this array uh, beforehand when you're, uh, sorry, at runtime. So that's, that's a little better. Are we completely done? Uh, not quite. Because odds are that you may have, for instance, this amount of element, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, okay? Which is, and I did the math, 277 times 8, and that's the amount of arrays you can, you can process, plus 6. And the 6 are leftovers. That's the reminder of the integer division, you know that. Oh, so how can we, how can you process the, the remaining 6 elements? Well, actually, there are two methods for that. And the two methods will give you very different performances. You, so you need to be aware of that to choose the right method, the right pattern of code, sorry, the right pattern of code to, to handle that. The first one is to use this nifty object given you by the vector API, which is a mask object. I didn't put the type here, I could have done that. The type is vector mask, simply said. Okay, and you see that this index in range method that comes still, that is still coming from your species object because this species object has all the information to compute that. This species object follows the, 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 the elements that you've consumed from your original array to put in the, in the, in the CMD array. All right, so it knows when there are leftovers and stuff. And when it sees that, oh, there are only six elements left, it will actually give you a mask. A mask is just a, a field of bits. You could, you could see that as an array of Booleans but the vector API doesn't know what a Boolean is, so you can't really use Booleans. And uh, when a Boolean is true, it means that this cell of this array, the component of this vector should be used, and if it's false, it means that it should not be used. So in that case, the six first element will be true, and the two last will be false for the last uh, piece of uh, array to be used. And all the methods you can think of, you can think of in the vector API, well, most of them, uh, can take a mask as a further argument. So this mask has, uh, uh, acts as some kind of validator. So the from array method will tell you, okay, you take only six instead of taking eight in this vector. And when you add the two vectors, you are going only to, sorry, you are going to add only the first six elements instead of all the elements because you passed the mask as an argument. And when, when you do result into array, it's the same. You are going to take only the six elements and not the eight elements because of the mask. Now the problem is, not all CPUs support masking. So if you write this code in that way, it will work, no matter what, because the API is smart enough to simulate masking. If your CPU does not support that, the vector API can do that. But if it doesn't support masking, you will have a performance hit on this code. Is this performance hit an issue or not in the, in the overall computation of your application? You need to, you need to measure that. Okay, you need to measure that. Yeah, question? Unfortunately. To be honest, I'm not completely sure. Well, I, well I, I, I didn't have access to a CPU that supports masking, so, but I could see that between this pattern of code and the next one I'm going to show you, there is a difference that you can measure uh, easily on, on, on simple processing. Exactly, the, 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 the comment is that you want to fix just the last iteration, but you need to, you, to go through all the iterations, and that's the case, yeah. But you can still fix, okay, so it relies on masking. I need to go to, to show you the slides at some point. So you, you have another pattern, which is much simpler. Uh, if you don't like for loops, well, you'll need to end up with another for loop, which is, <laughs> okay. And this, this look really looks like ugly code, but if you do not support masking, this is actually what you should be doing. You just process all the elements you can process without masking and you put the leftover, you process them just normally in a, in a dump. <laughs> now, if you want to really uh, completely screw up your performances, I think that you can create a stream for the last part of it and, and do it parallel stream. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> okay, so the comment was you should be doing a virtual thread with it. Don't do parallel stream in virtual thread. Gosh, I'm going to... 
for the first time in, <laughs> the speaker is going to throw tomatoes at the audience. Usually <laughs> it's the opposite. <laughs> okay. Which one is better? I don't know. You know, because you know your application, you know your processing, you know your CPU. You need to measure that. Okay, if you're using this kind of thing, it's because you're looking for performances. So you need to measure performances. You, you, can't, you can't escape this one. All right. Some more vocabulary. Okay, so now you can add two vectors, but m the most important part is that you know how to load your data from your arrays to a vector, and you know how to transfer them back from these vectors to uh, your data. We're going to see more operations on, on these vectors and a little uh, point of vocabulary. Usually when you're working with vectors, you talk about components because this is how it's working, you know. Uh, the vector API is actually talking about lanes. So if you check the documentation, the JEPs and this kind of thing, when you see, and, and the API, and we're going to see, to see what, when you, when you uh, see things talking about lanes, it's, it's actually a component of a vector. That the, the word is the same. Why people are talking about lane? Because this is where your data is flowing. Your data is nicely flowing through lanes, floating on the, okay, blah, 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 on the stream that is not parallel, um, <laughs> and, and stuff. So you have two kinds of operation in the API. Lane-wise operation that operate on one lane of several vectors, and th that's the case for the addition, and all the arithmetic operations. And you have cross-lane <coughs> cross operations that operate on the different lanes of a single vector. And they are also executed in parallel. Okay? So, for instance, if you take a max on all the components or all the lanes of a vector, that's a cross-lane operation because you need to check all the lanes of a single vector to get the mask, to, to get the max. And the same if you want to compute the sum. So how can you could you compute the norm of a vector? Norm of a vector is first you need to compute the square of each component, sum them up, and take the square root. We don't really care about the square root. Uh, maybe we'll talk more about it uh, a little later. So let's take a float vector. Float vector, the species preferred, that's the species for the float vector and your CPU. We uh, take the sum that is zero, then we're going to loop over all the components, and I'm not going to write the full pattern here because we already covered that. You, take, you load your array uh, in your vector, you compute the square, multiplying the vector by itself, and that's a lane-wise operation. And then at the end of the day, you are going to call reduce lane and pass the operation you want to apply on this reduction, which is a cross lane operation. And the operation you want to pass is the add operation. And at the end of the day, you just you have the sum. Okay, you did the sum piece by piece, sum of the square piece by piece. Okay, you just extract the square root and you're done. That's the norm of your vector. Okay, why is this add here? not a lambda expression? Well, because that's an assembly instruction, and lambdas do not map very well to single assembly instruction. Probably heard about that before. Okay, so you have vector.add, vector.mask, .max, .mean, etc. All these are assembly instructions, so they are mapped to kind of constants in the API. But that's not the only way to conduct this computation. We decided to take each subvector, compute the squares and do the sum and accumulate it in a number, but you can also write it in that way. Okay? You compute the square, you accumulate it in a single vector, and you do the reduction, the cross line operation at the end of the computation. Uh -huh. Yes. Okay? Which one is faster? Guess what? I don't know. It depends on your case. Depends on your application. You have two ways of designing the same computation. The result hopefully will be the same. With floating point operation, you can never know, but yeah. To be close enough. Okay. But you need to check which one is faster. Would yeah? It which core you're running on? Sorry? Would it matter which core you're running on? What what does it match with the core you're running on? Yeah. I'm sorry. No, it doesn't matter. All the calls are 
equivalent from this. Uh, for floating points, I guess so. I guess so. You think it's different? It might be. Sure. Might be. Okay, so it could be different. Hopefully, it will operate on a on a on a on a core with a floating point um, processing unit for the for the CMD kernel, because if it doesn't, it will, uh, it will have trouble. Yeah, other question. Can you control the number of CPUs? Here, using, you're using one core of one CPU, using one kernel stuff. If you want to use several kernels, you need to rely on multi-threading, because this is how you can. Yeah, absolutely. How could you compute an average? Same, float. You need to reduce the vectors with the add operation, and you just need to count them, which is quite easy, actually. It's just the size of the array and you divide by the size of the array, and that, that will give you the average of the vector. Okay? Why can't you pass a lambda? <laughs> because a lambda is not a, an assembly instruction, as simple as that. And I can tell you that when you begin to write vector, vector code like this one, the temptation to pass a lambda is really high. But the compiler is there to tell you, hey, you can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. <laughs> All right, what about filtering? Filtering is a little different because you need to invalidate some components of your record, some lanes of your record, okay? But we already saw that you have this masking stuff that is there to tell you, oh, this component is okay, this one is not okay. And filtering relies on the use of masking, but you can't avoid it in that case. So if your kernel does not support masking, then you will have a performance hit, but you need to pay this performance hit because there's no other way to do it. How is it working? Well, you have a, a vector of integers, 3, 8, 5, blah, blah, blah. Okay, and I want to uh, apply the current filtering greater than 5. What, I we, what I'm going to get is a mask. The mask is this one. I put true or false in it. Of course, it's not true or false. It's 0 and 1, but it doesn't matter. Okay, and then you have an, an operation, a cross-lane operation, which is called the compression, that is going to just take the lanes of your vector that matches the mask, that match the mask, all right, and that is going to compress it at the beginning of the resulting vector. Okay, so here I only have the eight, the six, the nine, and the seven that match the mask. So when you compress the result, you get a smaller vector with only these numbers uh, in it. And this is what you can do for do the f to do the filtering. It really depends on what you want to do at the end of it. Okay, but the idea is the, the following. You compare your vector with the vector operators. Once again, this is an assembly instruction, the lambda expression, greater than GT and five. You compress using the mask you get and you put the result into the array using the max index, which is the offset. And the mask will give you an information which is called true count which is the number of true value it was carrying, meaning that it only transferred true count elements into your array. So if you want to filter a very large array using this pattern of code, you are going to jump from max index to max index plus true count to, uh, to get the next offset for the next, uh, for the next loop. But you could also do it in another way, without compression, directly passing the mask to this into array uh, method. So it, it really depends, here I'm just copying the filtering, the result of the filtering in an array. It really depends on what you want to do in the end. If you want to compress or not, that's the choice you need to make depending on the algorithm you're implementing. So at the end of the day, if you want to do some reduction, well, here is the double species. You also have a double species. Okay, so you can do the comparison then reduce the lane using the, the, the add, passing the mask. So it's only going, it is going to apply the reduction only on the value of the mask that have been validated. Okay, and then do the true count so that you can jump from one place to the other um, on the, in your, um, sorry, in your resulting array. And here what I'm doing is uh, just an average at the end of it. So I'm just um, filtering and doing the average. So I don't need to compress. All I need to do is sum the right elements, count the number of elements I've, uh, I have reduced. So at the end of the day, I will just divide the sum by the count. 
Okay. This is how you can do uh, map filter reduce. I didn't do the mapping, but the map filter reduce is there. So if you want to know more, there is a very interesting page um, on the on the OpenJDK uh, GitHub repository. So if you want to copy the the link to, to the page, okay. There's also a shortened link that is maybe more handy. Apart from that, I created it, so <laughs> I don't even know if it will last for long. Uh, if you want to talk about performances, it really depends on the hardware you're running on. So I just run one bench of data, which is the string comparison. If you want to compare string of characters, okay, using this API, and you see that uh, you can check the the size of the string. Basically, the scalar version is just and grows along with the length of the string. It, the JDK Vector API also grows with the size of the string, but you get better and better performances. And uh, uh, for, for, for a string of 1K character, you get uh, almost a factor of 10 without relying on... Um, <laughs> I don't have the time, sorry. Without relying on the concurrent programming. I'm just going to finish and get the, to your question after that. So let's conclude because I have zero minutes left. I should have uh, tried to parallelize this talk, I'm sorry. Uh, the, the vector, as you can see, the vector API is really about processing arrays of numbers, integer numbers or floating point numbers, but it's not object, it's not string of character, it's really numbers. Where can it be used? Array and string comparison, string compare, ignore case, string char set, char set comparison, hash code computation, array sorting without any merge sort. Arc tangent computation and many more mass computation, including the square root, by the way, or parallel big integers. That's for Heinz. But it can also be used for many other things because vector computation is about linear algebra. And what can you do with linear algebra? Well, you can do neural networks, you can do machine learning, you can do artificial intelligence. Thank you for your attention. <clears throat>